Thank you. So it's a good time to be talking about failure, actually. Um, there's a whole conference now devoted to it, FailCon. Uh, it was just last month, I believe. Um, that one's actually focused on startups, though, and the, the, notion of, the notion of failure in startup culture has uh, some different connotations than failure in uh, open source development uh, or in other environments. Um, and those are really more what I want to talk about today. I made three decisions about failure a couple of years ago. Some of them I made them before the fact, some of them I made after the fact, uh, that have worked for me. So I'm going to tell you about them, and hopefully they'll work for you too. First of all, fast beats slow. Um, so I love this. This, uh, this image is from the Python challenge, which probably a lot of you have seen. I absolutely love the Python challenge as a teaching tool. Main reason is because feedback is instantaneous. Uh, when you're when you're trying a problem, you can tell immediately whether you've succeeded or whether you've failed. Most of the Python challenge uh, problems, at least early on, are easily solved within the REPL, the read eval print loop, the interpreter. I love the REPL as a model for doing everything, um, because when you think in terms of uh, when, you, when you think in terms of read, evaluate, get results, that leads you to that, that leads you to the state of mind where you can where you can quickly figure out what's a failure and what's not. Now, the other factor in figuring out quickly what failed and what succeeded is decisiveness. During Hurricane Sandy, uh, everybody in New York was freaked out for days about this crane hanging above 59th Street. You know, is it going to fall? Is it going to is it going to survive? Nobody knew. What it comes down to is tests without success criteria are not really tests. If you just have to wait and see whether it works in production or not, this is not going to help you. Uh, another example that, uh, that may provide a little bit of schadenfreude for folks in the audience here. Um, if you read the Ars Technica art article that came out the other day about um, the Romney campaign's Orca project, yeah, they had this massive, massive get out the vote system that, the, that they were trying to scale up, like 11 database servers behind it, and they didn't do any dry runs. Election day, it fell the hell over. So, if you, if you think you know what's going, to, uh, what's going to be a decisive test, but you're not sure until it actually happens, you might want to rethink what your success and failure criteria actually are. Let me give you a, a personal case study example of this. So, Telecomics is, a, is an activist organization that I'm part of. We're kind of the yin to Anonymous's yang. Where Anonymous breaks things, we rebuild things. And so back in January of last year, when uh, Hosni Mubarak's administration turned off the entire internet in Egypt, people all over the, you know, people all over the, the English-speaking uh, internet said, crap, what are we going to do? And telecomics was looking for people with ideas. Um, and I, I came across them when they, when, they, when they put out a call for ham radio operators. Well, I happen to be one. I also happen to be living in Belgium at the time, and Belgium is conveniently within a distance uh, of Egypt where if you, if, you have, if you have decent enough equipment, you can probably reach it. So I spent about a week uh, you know, building antennas, setting them up on top of, uh, you know, on top of a six-story building in the middle of an ice storm, trying desperately to, um, to make any kind of uh, radio contact to folks in Egypt. Well. What we didn't realize uh, at the time was that there's only about 500 ham radio operators in Egypt, and um, most of them are part of the military. So, <laughs> so that actually didn't help. Um, and, and that was why, after like, less than a week of this, we were like, all right, screw it, we're hanging this one up. We're, you know, we, we quit that project, and fortunately, other people had been working on other projects, um, like uh, Speak to Tweet, um, we were, you know, spamming people's web logs with the phone numbers of dial-up modems in Holland that, uh, that they could call if they needed to, to try to get out. Those all worked. I mean, we were, just, we were literally just throwing every idea we could at the wall to see what stuck, but we would have wasted a lot of effort if we hadn't, if we hadn't made the call that, okay, this ham radio thing was a decisive failure. 
let's work on the things that seem to be getting some return on investment here. But, you know, this all just sounds like what we already know from, you know, from test-driven development and behavior-driven development, which is why the missing piece, and amusingly enough, the one that I actually came up with before the fact, is don't be afraid to be, uh, don't be, afraid to be wrong in public. I mean, this is, this is the missing piece from FailCon. Um, you know, FailCon has a lot of stuff on the agenda about, you know, how to recognize that you failed, but not how failing in public can actually accelerate your, uh, the, the path to success. I mean, the scariest thing about failure is wondering, my God, who's going to find out? But, you know, look how well that works anytime, um, you know, a politician or an executive uh, ends up taking a bath for having, you know, for having covered up some failure that they would have been far better off if they had just admitted in the first place. We'll, we'll come back to this particular graph later. But let's talk about why things fail. First of all, do not fight physics or mathematics. Perpetual motion machines don't work. Um, and you'd think that it would be fairly rare that you find that, you know, that you're trying to fight mathematics. Um, that said, we see this in the security industry all the time. Um, most of the conferences I go to, I, go, I get up and I talk about language theoretic security, which has to do with um, using the principles of formal language theory in order to handle inputs in a safer fashion. Um, you know, because the vast majority of uh, you know, web application bugs out there are, as it turns out, input handling bugs. The vast majority of input handling code out there is hand-rolled and prone to failure. Um, and if you put yourself in a, in a situation where, for instance, you know, you're, you're taking, I don't know, raw JavaScript, or your, uh, you know, or your, H your HTML uh, input has the, you know, has the possibility of, uh, you know, including uh, unescaped or unsanitized user inputs. This is, you know, that's, that's an example of, you know, the undecidable failure that I was talking about earlier. Um, you know, when you're, when, you're, when, you're when you're putting yourself in a situation where the only way to determine whether it works or not is to just, uh, is, is, to, is to watch it blow up in real time, True, it works, but it's it's not going to be the it, it it's not going to be the best end for you. Um, so, another a, a, a distinction to make here, though, is that infrastructure is not the same as mathematics. Um, if you're in a situation where, say, the global interpreter lock is ruining your day, um, that might mean that it's time to hang it up. That might mean that it's time to rearchitect or that might mean that it's time to switch to another language. Or not, um, because amazing things happen when people don't know any better. Um, case in point, uh, when I was in graduate school, um, I did a Google Summer of Code project that my advisor said, you shouldn't even bother, this is impossible. $5,000 later, um, there, was, you know, there was a fork of Postgres that supported data mining, because I didn't, I didn't know enough to realize that this was hard. I ended up having to go in and like modify parts of Postgres that I'm pretty sure were not supposed to be modified in order to do it, but it worked. Now, when 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 when, when your goals include um, being widely supported, this is not necessarily the best idea. But it is pretty amazing what you can power through when you just don't know any better. You're probably wrong, and that's okay. You know, being wrong is totally, a, is totally a reasonable way to fail. And this is actually why failing in public speeds up the green to red cycle. Basic fact of human nature. People love to be right. Let them do that. It's awesome. It, because if people can be right at your expense, you don't have to care about the your expense part. Just give them, give them the opportunity to be right and then, just, and, and then profit from that and keep going. That also, it also doesn't mean that it has to be embarrassing. You know, as developers, for the past several years, we've been building up a culture that actually supports failing in public. Just look at Stack Overflow. 
you know, and everything that's been built on top of the Stack Exchange platform. You know, this is a, th these are millions of examples of people saying, I've gotten myself up a creek and I have no idea what to do, somebody help me. And people do. People do, and it solves so many problems. So, back to our graph. The other, the other, uh, the other reason why things fail, that I've run into at least, is people just not getting it. By and large, at the beginning, this is going to be everybody. Getting the point across to people is hard, especially when you're doing something, uh, when you're doing something that people have not done before. I mentioned the uh, language theoretic security you know, talks that I've, that, I, that I've given a bunch of other places. It, it took me probably five years of just going to conferences, having conversations with people, talking about, you know, talking about parsing, talking about the, the differences between you know, different classes of language, just to get across to the just to get across to people the idea that it's not just the you know, it's not that a val is bad. It, you know, a val is only bad when you can't predict what the results of the uh, of the eval is, go is going to be, right? This took time, um, and the reason for that is that communication, just getting an idea across to other people, is also a read eval print loop. Um, if you look at uh, the, if, if you look at uh, you know, basic uh, you know, communication theory 101, um, this, is, this is going like back to you know, Claude Shannon and uh, some of the people in the 30s and 40s who uh, followed on to his work. Um, you know, the, you'll, you'll, see dis you'll, you'll see discussions of you know, one person will say it will have an idea and express something which is not necessarily the idea that they intended to, uh, to express. But, you know, they'll put it into words, they'll say it, somebody will hear it. What they hear might not necessarily be exactly what the, uh, ex exactly what, uh, the person even said, much less what they meant. And what they understand from, the out from what they heard is not necessarily going to be any of the previous three. And so getting that correct takes a lot of, rep it takes a lot of repetition. And this is okay. I mean, you know, everybody's a, you know, everybody understands things in different ways. And... If the problem that you're running up against is, you know, naysayers who are telling you, oh, what you're doing is never going to work, maybe they just don't understand what it is you're doing. So here's another, uh, here's another case in point. So I have this friend, Nadim Kabaisi, who lives in Montreal. He's a Lebanese guy, and he's been working for uh, the last year and change on a project called CryptoCat, which is web-based encrypted chat. So... Nadim is not working against physics here. Nadim is working against infrastructure because already you're looking at, okay, we want to deliver code securely to the browser. How the hell do we do that? And furthermore, we want to make sure that, uh, it, you know, that, that this is being delivered in a way that, uh, that can't be um, messed with after the fact and, for, and also that the crypto is correct. So this, this is a hard problem, and the, the, the CryptoCat uh, development cycle seems to have basically settled out into Nadim releases a new version, the entire security community piles onto him on Twitter and shits on him for about a week, and then the user numbers jump. He's, uh, as, of, as of October, he's looking at about 100,000 uniques a month. Um, and the, the reason why this is the case is that the problem that he, he's trying to solve is a much more general problem than the very idealized problem that, you know, that they want to solve. Um, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the crypto community, there's a, there's, a, there's a very strong focus, understandably so, on the worst possible situation, you know, which is where, like, you know, governments are committing man-in-the-middle attacks on, uh, you know, on users in their country so that they can you know, perform deep packet inspection and read everybody's private communications and stuff. You know, this is a problem. This is a big problem. This is a hard problem to solve. And the infrastructural problems that, uh, you know, that CryptoCAD is facing don't uh, you know, make that particular use, ca use case actually impossible. But that's not the user base that Nadim is trying to serve. You know, he, the people who he wants to help are people who are in danger from somebody, but not necessarily a state actor. And he's got about 100,000 of them a month, which is pretty awesome. 
So, you know, the communications REPL continues. But, you know, what's, what's been really fascinating watching this project uh, spin up from, you know, from the very beginning is that um, he's, he's getting work done faster than any other project I've ever seen. He's moving faster than Tor, he's moving faster than Briar, um, he's taking a lot of heat for it, but because he's, you know, because he's got the guts to fail quickly, fail decisively, and fail in public, he is succeeding faster than, you know, faster than any other project like this I've ever seen. So that's actually all I've got, apart from one other thing, which is that I'd like to do the Q&A a little bit differently. Um, if you've got any questions, um, please feel free to come up. Um, but also, if you've got any failures you'd like to share. If you want to out yourself about something that, you, something that uh, you've been trying and just have not managed to get right, now's the time. Step up, let us help you. <laughs>